Rafael, thank you so much for joining us today. So good to see you again. You are uh, out there doing a lot since we last spoke, and I can't wait to hear all about your updates. But first, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, no. Well, first off, Stephanie, it's an honor to be back on the show. And I know the first time we talked, it was great to be able to do so. I'd been listening to your podcast for quite some time, and it's really cool to be back up for a second time. So, you know, kudos to you for what you do. But as far as my background, you know, I, I think we mentioned briefly on the first podcast, but, you know, I'm, I'm a commercial real estate broker out here in Louisville, Kentucky. I've been in the business roughly five years. Uh, my background initially is in, in engineering. I was in software development for a while and then got into the brokerage space. And ever in and, and 2019 is when I transitioned. And ever since then, I've just been operating in a brokerage capacity and I've started to, you know, buy investment property and now getting into the development space. So, you know, just a little bit of everything, you know, it's kind of an evolution as we, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, in the discussion, but that's just kind of a brief overview. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not from Louisville originally. I, my dad was military, moved around all over the world. I lived in Europe from until I was 14 and, you know, went to school in Arizona and then hopped around DC, Puerto Rico. Now I'm Louisville. So a lot of, uh, you know, hopping around in my life. <laughs> You know, a lot of people that are successful, they've seen all sides of, they've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly around the world. And that's mm -hmm. what gives them perspective for working hard. Um, so I think that's great, personally. Um, let's start with the state of the market. And, you know, people love our podcast because we're pretty brutally honest here because everybody's going through things at all times. So let's talk about what you're seeing and mm -hmm. maybe what, Obviously, we are all hoping to see a decrease in interest rates, but um, until then, what what is happening in your area and market? Yeah, yeah, it's a great, great question. So probably similar to a lot of people around the country, you know, transaction volume is down significantly uh, year over year on the buy and sale side. Uh, leasing activity has actually been pretty pretty active. So, mm. you know, over the last call it year or so, I would say, you know. On my the the sales side, you know, I've I've, I've definitely had a, a slowdown, but on the leasing side, there, there's been definitely an uptick. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, although we see some negative signs in the economy with the the unemployment rate ticking up and, you know, and you know, inflation is still not quite under control as of yet. For whatever reason, the consumer still is spending a lot, which is probably a bad thing long term, but in in the short term, it seems to be you know, keeping a lot of these uh, enterprises afloat. So, you know, on the retail side, we, it's been a very active last year or so. But mm -hmm. regarding investment real estate, it's definitely been affected. I mean, I, I work with a lot of people who are looking to do development, uh, especially in land acquisition, ground up construction, and that's been very slow over the last year or so. Um, so, yeah, and, and you know, we can dive into more nuance on my specific market if you'd like, or we can kind of take it more of a general approach however you'd like, so. Um, are sellers coming down on price at this point? Uh, some are, uh, a lot aren't. I think what it comes down to is the staying power. Now, I think what, what you know, there's a lot of sellers out there that do have bank notes that are coming due. Now, the kicker is that a lot of banks are trying to work it out with the sellers, especially if they see that there's a path towards them ultimately being able to be, you know, compliant in the near future. Because uh, again, mm -hmm. banks aren't in the business of owning real estate, so they really don't want to have to get, you know, foreclose on the property and then have to go through the whole process of getting it off their books. And so, in most instances, if the seller is, if they see a path towards the seller or the owner being able to perform, they're usually going to be able to work things out with, you know, the 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 the, the owner. Now, there there are also a lot of sellers out there that own the properties outright, and they're just like, hey, we'll wait around. We don't have to sell right now, so there's no real urgency. And so. You know, do I think that there will be a, a, a mountain of distress? No, I don't think so. Uh, but, you know, I do. And I'm very optimistic over the next 12 to 24 months that rates are going to start coming down and transaction volume is going to spike because there's a lot of demand. It's not like people don't want to buy stuff. It's just kind of we're at an impasse. And so once the gap is bridged, I think we're going to start seeing significant volume. And so I'm optimistic uh, for 2025 and 2026. I think it's, they're going to be great years in the transaction for transactions. So, yeah. Agree. I think now it's time to get properties in contract uh, mm -hmm. at a lower price and lower, a uh, higher cap rate. And mm -hmm. then, you know, hopefully by, I'm sure before election, they will decrease it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All, all signs indicate that they are likely going to make some move in September. Um, you know, 
whether or not that's the right move or not, I, you know, we could, we could talk about that for hours, uh, no, yeah. but, uh, yeah. but yeah, I think it's ultimately going to happen. And, you know, I, I, I don't know what type of, I mean, most likely it's going to be a very slight decrease and probably the next year or so we'll see a little bit more, um, uh, you know, drop in, in the fed funds rate. Um, it's, uh, you know, the interest rates, you know, have already started to decrease because a lot of banks are obviously tied, tie their rates to prime or they tie their rates to the five-year, 10-year treasuries. And they've already been dipping a bit. So I've been asking, I've been getting quotes from commercial lenders where, you know, three or four months ago, rates were probably 8%. Now we're looking at seven and a quarter, seven and mm -hmm. a half. So there is a slight decrease happening already. Uh, but I think that's going to get more amplified over the next 12 to 24 months. So, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in terms of, you mentioned there's a lot of leasing activity who, mm -hmm. who is leasing nowadays? Yeah. Well, I can only speak for myself because I do yeah, a lot in the in retail space and yeah, I do yeah. a lot in the retail space. So I, right. I can comment on those. I mean, a lot of quick service users are, are actively looking for space and granted the, the, the places that we're looking for space for are in the top places in town where everyone's looking for space. So, you know, if you own an A-class asset in particular in retail, I mean, you're sitting pretty. I think the the vacancy uh, rate for retail in these top corridors is almost zero. I mean, you literally cannot find a space. And one, when one comes available, you know, it goes either immediately or in, in oftentimes what happens is since I built relationships with brokers in town, they'll call me before something happens and they'll say, hey, tenant X may be, you know, leaving here soon. Do you got anyone that is interested in the space? And so some a lot of times it doesn't even come available publicly, at least. Um, in that regard. So like, for example, I got a deal right now that we're working for one of my users and the properties, the space isn't even available yet. So it's wow. just, you know, that, that type of stuff happens and it happens in all markets. It's not unique to our market per se, but you know, it, it just is what it is. So from a retail standpoint, you know, I would say anywhere from like 1500 to 3000 square feet, which is kind of the sweet spot for a lot of retailers, it's particular quick service and, you know, high volume types of retailers. Those are very hard to come by, and if you if they have, if they have a drive through, good luck. I mean, there's no, there's nothing really available right now. So, um, yeah. Well, as they say, you can fix a real estate investing mistake by buying something in the right location. <laughs> oh so, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And and really, it's too path of progress because you know five years ago maybe that area is not the greatest, but you know now you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, like if you would have bought five years ago in this area. You, you're obviously sitting very pretty. So we, you know, it, it, strategically and on my case, you know, on the investing side and development side, you know, the, the properties that I've invested in the last year or so have been in the path of progress. So they're okay. not in top areas as of yet, but all the indications are pointing in that direction. Um, and we could talk about what to look for in some of those in instances. And again, this it is a calculated risk, but it is a risk. There could be a situation where, you know, a, a bomb falls there tomorrow and now it becomes not a very attractive area, but you know, there's, there's definitely a, a higher percentage of probability something will take place there. That's positive. So. Yeah. Everything is risky. So what mm -hmm. do you look for? I'm b briefly guessing multifamily projects being built in the area. Yeah. I mean, um, that's part of it. Yeah, of course. I mean, you look at residents, obviously rooftops for retail is, is huge because those are the demographics that are ultimately going to be shopping at the places or eating at the places that are going to be nearby. Right. You know, we look a lot for different city initiatives that are kind of pushing for certain mm. things to happen in areas. So I follow closely with, you know, different rezonings that are taking place. Though These are all publicly available, by the way. You can go to, you know, in our in our metro market, we have uh, the metro council that that votes on rezonings that are taking place. I mean, if you just look through a list of the the the, the ones that are being heard throughout the every two weeks, you can, it's a treasure trove um, of mm. information. So, you know, in our, in our case, we're, we're, we're under contract right now to purchase a property uh, on, in this small, this corridor called Logan street. And we just recently rezoned the property to a commercial zoning. And within that little strip over the last year, there's been like seven commercial rezones and it's wow. within a small little strip. So as you can tell with, from that, that that's indicating that that's where everything's swinging. And, you know, we, another thing you could follow along with is, you know, traffic patterns. So we looked at, you know, the the proposed projects with the infrastructure bill that was passed by, you know, the, the, the national level through the Biden administration, and that trickles down to the local level and the state level. Well, they had infrastructure projects for roadways, sidewalks, uh, you know, two-way conversions for streets. And for those of you guys who are listening, two-way conversions for a business standpoint is great because it allows for slower traffic and more walkability. So in this case, this particular property that we're acquiring is on a street that's 
being actively converted to a two-way street. So it helps wow. improve the walkability and, you know, it's, it's only going to benefit business in the long run. So, you know, those are some of the things to look out for as you're, as you're speculating on projects. And granted, this is not a, a stabilized asset. This is a vacant property that we put under contract at a good price. We allow, we worked with the seller to allow for us to rezone the property, which took almost a year. So it's not, it's, it's a slow process, but in the long run, it's going to be, in my opinion, very beneficial because I think in the next five years, this area is going to be where one of the top areas in, in Louisville, maybe New Lou is a, a big mm. area here that's very popular. I could foresee this area becoming kind of the next mini New Lou, you know, so it's, it's a benefit. So anyways, yeah. that's, that's, I digress. No, you don't. That, that was great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this, um, in this interview, I also wanted to touch on developing because you and I are building our first ground up development right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it is not for the faint of heart. And uh, there are problems uh, on a regular basis. Um, and not a lot of people talk about the problems. Um, but I think it's really important to do so because 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 they happen with every single development. There is no easy deal out there. And we just got to figure out a solution to the problems as they come. So could you tell us what you're doing and what were some of the challenges you've had so far? Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that. And candidly, I'll be clear. I know with you, you you've already are actively probably in a construction phase where you're starting to erect the structure or you're not yet. Not yet. There. So no. we're, we're pre that we're pre that as well, but we are, you know, I'll, I'll provide some context to the development that we're undertaking to kind of, you know, share some context. So we similar type of, it's in the same corridor that I described about this other property that we're under contract to purchase, but this property was in the same corridor and one street over just slightly South. And uh, it has a lot of potential. It, it has a third of an acre of land and a very densely populated corridor you know, it had an existing structure on site, which we were trying to incorporate into a development, kind of a mixed use development. Obviously, this, the, ultimately, the structure just didn't support what we wanted to do. So our goal is to eventually demo the structure and direct a brand new construction building. Uh, the, okay. the premise of the development was to be uh, a, a real estate development and then an operating business. So the operating business was going to be a brewery. Um, that we would own and operate with a business partner of ours. And then we would have small mini bay restaurants. So imagine those 300 square foot kitchens that you ultimately rent out to entrepreneurs and we would charge maybe two grand or 2,500 a month. And that's all in. So they would be, you know, we'd pay the water, electric, whatever else. And it's very easy and approachable for a lot of entrepreneurs to enter into and, you know, start their businesses. And there's a huge need for that here. And I'm sure all, all over the country, but especially here, we're a foodie city. There's a lot of, uh, there's Sullivan University is a large, uh, university here for culinary arts. And so there's kind of a feeder there already. Uh, so mm. it was kind of a natural progression into the development. Now, uh, you know, obviously the challenges that we faced first off was the rezone. It took us a year and two months to rezone the property, even though it was a non-contentious rezone, there was no one who really showed up to the neighborhood meetings. And, you know, so it was really a straightforward process, but Jefferson County, the area that we're in here in Louisville is notoriously difficult to get things done in. Um, but we were able to kind of ultimately get the rezone done uh, and we, my business partner and I, uh, put in some capital and then we raised a little bit of money to kind of round out the capital stack so that we could ultimately close in the property cash. Um, you know, since then we've been interacting with different banks. And again, this is a brand new venture. So we're going to be going SBA that we can't go really conventional. No bank would be able to lend on us for this size of development. It's going to be roughly $3 million is what we're projecting on the development side. And, you know, I just mentioned offline to you, like, we had three business partners, my business partner, myself, uh, I'm a commercial broker. My other business partner is a real estate partner. And then an another one of our business partners was the brewer. And so as of this morning, we got an email from him saying he's no longer involved in the the, the development. Um, and partly to the fact that it, the lead time to getting it open, and I think, you know, it's going to take mm. about a year and a half to be up and running. And it's a lot to ask for someone to, to hold off for that long to be able to, you know, commit to this type of project. But it's ultimately something we're just like, man, this sucks because... <laughs> Obviously, that's a big piece of the development. That's a big piece of what we're trying to do. And so we obviously com communicated with the investors that we have, you know, had conversations with early on kind of pre presenting this particular project. And, you know, luckily, all the investors that have, we've raised money for believe in us. And they say, look, guys, we, we obviously have faith in you guys for now. We'll, we'll keep our investment with you guys. And, you know, we trust you to try to find a new business partner. And if for whatever reason, 
that doesn't work, there may be an opportunity for us to then pivot and maybe do a different type of development on site. So, you know, I, I think it just goes to show that you could put in a year and a half into something and then you hit a huge wrench um, that, and then you just got to find a way to kind of pivot and find yep. a new approach to what you are doing. And I, I said this to my business partner today. I said, you know, if it were easy, everyone would do it. I mean, this yep. is not, <laughs> this is not for the faint of heart. So I think that nope. it's a, you know, just a testament to the fact that, you know, you know, everything looks good on a spreadsheet, but until you're actually in it, you're, you really don't know what you're talking about. So. Yeah. yeah. And it's really interesting how we must also keep sometimes, let's say a newer partner, right. We, we must keep them calm also. Right. Like you just said, if it was easy, everybody would be doing him. Remember, mm -hmm. <laughs> let me remind you of that. Um, mm -hmm. But I did. I do have a couple of questions. You said that the city is very difficult to deal with. What were the specific difficulties, and um, was it just time or non-responsiveness? Yeah, I think it's, it's multiple uh, multiple reasons. I think a big piece is the the somewhat of redundancy in certain things of the process. I mean, there's there's definitely several processes within the broader process of of receiving the rezone that I think is somewhat redundant. Um, I also think there's understaffed. They're they're just understaffed. So there's a lot of cases that are being submitted for rezone review, and you know ultimately, not everyone can service them. And so there's there different cadence of of the process. And even though, you know, it, it's a slam dunk deal. For example, like in our case, like the entire corridor is being rezoned. So you know, there's already a precedent been set. We're not asking for anything that's out of the ordinary. It would have been a slam dunk uh, home run deal, but you know, obviously, we had to wait our turn when that in that respect. And then, you know, I think part of it too is, you know, I think it, in any city, there's there's going to be a form of nimbyism, which is not in my backyard. So, yeah. sometimes there are pockets of the ta of the city where any proposed development is kind of ob 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 objected to, yeah. or it's objected to, and then you know, when, when things get pushed forward or try to get pushed forward, they say, okay, we'll allow that to happen. But then they try to put on all these different, you know, restrictions or things, yeah. requirements that make the, the development untenable. And so what ends up happening is that these plots of land gets, don't get developed or even worse, a, a decrepit vacant building sits there for decades. Yeah. Um, and then you're just, you're, you're no closer to getting that eyesore taken care of than you were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so, you know, I, I, again, I think it's a multitude of different reasons as to why, uh, but I would say those are probably the three most common. Or and yeah. the two that you can control are obviously the the process itself and then staffing. Um, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I heard donuts. I heard donuts. You can control meaning whenever you have a meeting at the city. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure to say, oh, I was just at a donut shop and yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, I have some donuts here because everybody will be at the meeting. So we, we had a, we had ours at a brewery. So we, we, we said, Hey guys, <laughs> like you guys want some beer, but no one showed up. So it was good. I was happy. <laughs> I didn't have to, I didn't have to spend any money. I was just like, Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and my other question was, if you don't mind sharing, what was the reasoning for the, the brewer and where would the brewer go? Right. Because he still has to wait a year and a half, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's part of it is that, you know, he's a young father and, you know, he's got, you know, obligations on outside of that, his wife's a nurse. So they, he would have been able to sustain himself per se, but, but it, it is a lot to ask for someone to say, look, stick around for a year and a half. And, you know, at this, at this moment, at that moment in time, then you'll have a salary and, Part of our arrangement with them was to take a, a piece of ownership uh, that would vest over time. So sure. again, we wanted to make it as attractive as possible for the individual. But you know, at some some point as well, you know, it comes down to the fact: can can you wait? Number two, is the vision aligned? Because part of what I and again, I talked to my business partner about this as well. Is that you know, my I'm not a I'm not a a brewer by nature. Like I don't really have any experience in that space. I know the economics of the brewing industry. I've I've obviously done a ton of research, so I think it's a very attractive space that could potentially be lucrative. But I don't claim to be an expert in any type of of space, uh, any vertical within that space. And so, you know, the 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 personality types between someone who's in the develop the real estate space versus someone who is in the brewing space that approaches it as more of a craft can sometimes not align. And so there yeah. definitely were times where we had to like kind of talk through things and say, okay, like. You know, I understand that this would be, you know, a great fit or great 
way to approach this process, but maybe approaching it from a from a more, you know, economically focused way would be a benefit. So like pre-revenue, like the the logic there was to not brew anything until we were closer to opening because then we would build yeah. anticipation. But for me, it's like, well, if we I'm I'm more of the you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the lean, lean startup model where it's yeah. like, let's, let's get a product rolling and, and iterate as we go. And maybe we'll yeah. start generating some revenue and this will be, you know, a, a venture that eventually, and eventually we'll refine it to a point where it becomes a lot more, you know, of a finalized product by the time we get open. And so that was kind of a point where mm. we were talking about, and I'm not saying that's what caused it to not work, sure. but again, this type of stuff is something that you, you again, different personalities, different visions, Again, it's a people business. It's not just a a, a black and white, uh, as as everyone makes it seem seem like. Um, yeah. In a yeah. in a vacuum, it would be perfect, but you know you have all these different other things at play that you got to contend with. So. Yeah, managing personalities, goals, and they have their own family things going, and so mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of different things. There are some um, co-founder questionnaires out there, at least for in the tech space, that they're phenomenally helpful, and they mm -hmm. go over questions like when when would you be when would it be enough for you? What what would be a circumstance that would make you would make you want to quit? What is important to you? And like that really helps align, at least go through the hard questions first, because it's very easy to get excited about something. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's super important to go over the difficult questions because the difficult moments will arrive very soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So no, yeah, 100%. Think... And, 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 and to, to be fair, I, I think it is, it does, it, it, it shouldn't everyone's different. So if you have a different way of viewing the world or the, you have a different way of approaching the, that process, it's not a right or wrong. Right. It, it, you know, it's better, but to your point, it's better to know now or early on than it is, you know, when you're in the thick of it and all of a sudden, you know, things are starting to, to fall apart around you. And, you know, the person you're supposed to be in the foxhole with decides this isn't for them. It's yeah. like, that's a problem, you know? So mm -hmm. I'm glad. Uh, but anyways, uh, I digress. <laughs> not at all um this has been great Raphael. uh is there anything else that you think is important for our audience to know with regards yeah. to either the market or development that we uh, haven't no, touched i don't think so i mean i think for development just understanding that although it sounds fun and it sounds exciting and you're you're going to be bringing something to fruition or bringing something to life it is not for the faint of heart but I would, I wouldn't change it. I think this is something that I really am excited about. And, you know, it, it's probably going to be hard the next year or two or three or however long it takes for us to get the thing done. And maybe over time, I'm going to take on more development projects. And, you know, you, I guess more so it's just choose your heart. Like if this is your, if this is the heart that you want, then do it. And, and, you know, <laughs> when you're, when you're going through the, the fire, put a smile on and just get through it, you know, cause at the end of the day, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll come out the other side, a better person. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My favorite uh, course, Landmark Forum, um, talks about it. what is hard? Like, what, is there hard here? Do you see difficulty here? No, you look at it as what is happening right now and what do you need to do to resolve it? So there is no, you know, I'm under the wheel or whatever it is that people use normally. It's more like looking at it from, a, okay, this is the situation. What do I need to do to address it? Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Rafael. So good to see you again. How can our listeners get in touch with you? No, thanks again, Stephanie. It was great. It was really nice to be able to catch up and, and talk about the subject, which I think is super important. So I'm glad we were able to discuss this. But just to get in touch, I mean, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I mean, you can type my name in, Rafael Collazo. Collazo spelled C-O-L-L-A-Z-O. It's a Spanish. Uh, well, it's Puerto Rican, but, you know, with Spanish, the double L is yeah. Um, you can just type my name in and I'm on all social platforms and yeah, it should be easy to find me. Do you still have a podcast? I do. Yeah. The commercial real estate one-on-one podcast. And so, you know, we talk about a variety of different topics pertaining to commercial real estate and every other week we invite speakers to talk about a variety of different topics. And so it's been great and we've been running it since 2020. So it's uh, looking forward to continuing along with it. So awesome. Thank you so much, Rafael. Really appreciate your time. Definitely.